So I started to see things come out of Tunisia, you know, as early as, you know, middle, late, of de late December, you know, people were talking about uh, student protests in Tunisia. There was like, you know, some videos uploaded, some Facebook posts showing some violence. And it just became very quickly apparent to me on Twitter and stuff that people were really um, kind of had had enough and that there was something real happening and that there was trouble to come, you know, something serious. So we were able to get in touch with people on the ground, mostly students at the beginning. And I think I, it's just, at the time, it was very clear to us that there were patterns emerging where, you know, there were already, you know, solidarity sort of protests in Egypt and even in Geneva and as far as France, well before the mainstream media started picking up the story and I guess realizing how significant the revolution or the uprising in Tunisia was. So back to your question, I mean, I think that, you know, people were obviously using Facebook, Twitter, other online platforms, even just blogs to mobilize, to organize, to get the message out. And they were, they were essentially trying to seek and find common ground, right? So in a lot of ways, this was a popular uprising as opposed to a political or a religious one. So often, you know, in the West and in the mainstream media, we view uprising or strive for anything that relates to dissent in the Arab world as having to have a sectarian angle or, you know, so on and so forth. And of course, as the story has evolved and gone from country to country, we've seen that. But I think, you know, whether or not we call these revolutions social media revolutions or Twitter revolutions or the Jasmine revolution, it doesn't really matter. The lesson to be learned is that the potential democratization of the Arab world is directly related to the democratization of media. And by that, I mean, you know, the use of social media, the use of online tools and technology to circumvent either oppression by governments or to essentially get the message out, but also to mobilize. You know, it was very interesting early on in Tunisia and in Egypt when the internet was shut down or when the government was operating fishing operations to target activists and netizens, what you saw was other people who were either all over the world or in other places or weren't even necessarily directly relating, related to the stories were so engaged and captured by what was happening that they volunteered their time to either relay tweets, you know, when the internet was down in Egypt, you saw a lot of journalists using their friends to tweet on their behalf, such as Sharif Kudus of Democracy Now!, um, uh, you know, Jeremy Scahill, who writes for The Nation, was one of the people who basically became the mouthpiece for Sharif when he was in Egypt on the ground in Tahrir. One thing you saw is, and everyone knows, that internet penetration rates in the Arab world across you know, northern Africa are relatively low. For example, Tunisia has a much higher internet penetration rate than Egypt. So obviously when you're mobilizing and when you're, tr you're trying to organize you know, a protest or whatever, you can't simply rely on the people who are online. You can't simply rely on you know, the fact that people have access. And even though a lot of people might not have fast access, a lot of people have what's called <laughs> Um, SMS and text so you know people can use social media and text and word of mouth and pamphlets and more traditional forms of media I mean what is social media social media and social networking are essentially the current and available and accessible tools of communication to spread information and to you know to, to bring people together so whether that's like these you know if people you know didn't have access to certain tools they maybe, for example, with Wa'al Ghanim, who started, uh, you know, in Egypt, the, the Facebook group, 350,000 followers, Dira Al Khalid. I mean, basically, he was able to translate the momentum online and the organizing online, which he had been involved with for months and years, and other groups in Egypt, opposition groups and student groups and youth groups. They had to do what was called field tests. So they'd go out into the street, you know, and they'd they'd uh, see if they'd print pamphlets and they'd see if they could rally you know, a broader coalition. And again, it's important to mention that this wasn't a political um, ideology that they were espousing. It was just literally against the current status quo. And that's something that everybody could rally behind and rally in, in multiple forms of, of media platforms, different platforms. It's also probably worth mentioning that, you know, in Egypt, when the internet was shut down, you know, a lot of people say, what did the dictator, or so to speak, President Mubarak, uh, learn from you know, President Ben Ali in Tunisia. Well, President Ben Ali didn't shut down the internet. He merely targeted these people who were using the internet activists. So that's one way in which he fought back. Whereas when Mubarak shut down the internet, you had millions, if not thousands of people who were accustomed, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who were accustomed to spending a lot of their time online engaging in civic engagement and dissent and discussion and conversations around these issues. And all of a sudden they had no means to do this anymore. So what did they do? Ironically, when the internet was shut down, that contributed to mobilizing people to go and turn to the streets.
The show is going to air, I told you, online on April 18th and then on May 2nd it's on TV and the entire concept or premise behind it is that we're trying to engage the communities across the world where these stories that you otherwise wouldn't see on the mainstream media, you know, people who are informed, people who understand directly how issues on the ground relate or affect or impact their lives, we want to leverage those people and give them voice. I mean, part of Al Jazeera English's broader sort of mission is voice, you know, giving voice to the voiceless and setting the news agenda from a global kind of south versus southern perspective. And so what we're trying to do is essentially allow people to come onto our studio and, and, and talk to us via, you know, a whole bunch of online platforms, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Skype even, you know, people Skyping in and it's a 15 minute, sh well it's a 30, it's a 25 minute show, but 15 minutes beforehand we're streaming live on air, uh, I mean on the web, sorry, and then 15 minutes afterwards we're streaming live. So the whole idea is to really finally create a convergence of online and TV, which has proven quite difficult in the past. And I think the way we're going to do it is that we're just really going to try and make sure that we can leverage voices that often don't make it to mainstream media, or if they do, they kind of come on once and then they disappear. But we're really trying to uh, position ourselves around communities that already exist across the world.